everyone. Welcome to Scholars Club at Home. I'm Julie Lefford. I'm the Executive Director for Alumni Engagement here at York University. Thanks for joining us today for Waking Up the Medicine, Instilling Anishinaabeg Knowledge in History. As this event is virtual and we're not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that the land acknowledgement I'm about to read might not be for the territory that you're on now. And if that's the case, please take the responsibility to acknowledge the territory you're on and the current treaty holders. A website um, that's a good resource for this is native-land, excuse me, native-land.ca. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located, which precede the establishment of the university. York acknowledges the presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. This area known as Tacoronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It's now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. I'm personally grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this land, and for all that I've learned and continue to learn from Indigenous peoples at York University and beyond. Before we introduce our speaker today, I want to give you a quick update. Um, a very warm welcome to the 2021-2022 academic year. Um, as you may be able to tell, I am uh, joining you today from my office on York's Keele campus. Um, and I'm happy to announce that York has safely reopened our campuses this week. Um, and I'm able to join you for my first week back. Many of the activities that we've missed over the last year and a half, whether it be in-person classes or extracurricular activities or just getting together to chat, have resumed. The most up-to-date university planning information can always be found on our Better Together website should you wish to visit your campuses. It's yorku.ca slash better together. So as always, we'd like to get to know the audience a bit better. So we have a quick poll for you before we start. Our question today is, how would you rate your knowledge regarding the topic of today's presentation? So please take a moment and respond to that. Thank you for participating. It's always helpful for us and our speakers to have an idea about who's in the audience, what kind of knowledge you already um, join us with, and um, we appreciate your, your participation. If you need help with this Zoom web webinar, feel free to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter your question. Our team is behind the scenes ready to help you. And that same button can be used to submit questions for our guest speakers to answer, guest speakers, excuse me, to answer during the Q&A period following the presentation. And for those of you watching live on Facebook, go ahead and submit any questions or comments through the comments section there, and the team will send them my way during the Q&A. Please note that all of your questions and comments are visible to our panelists and staff working behind the scenes. We ask that you keep your comments relevant and respectful. I'm very delighted to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Alan Probier, who is a two-time York grad with a Master's in Environmental Sciences and a PhD. He is also an assistant professor in the Department of History in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies and the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous History of North America. Dr. Alan Ojik Kobiar, Ruft Grouse Clan, is an Anishinaabe from Michigan First Nation. He was raised and educated on the reserve. He completed his master's and doctorate degrees here at York, as I said, and was hired in January 2020 in the history department. Uh, he was very recently awarded uh, the prestigious Canada Research Chair in Indigenous History in 2021. He currently resides in Michigan with his wife and three children. Welcome, Professor Kobier. So pleased to have you with us today. Thank you. I'll hand you things over to you. I'm looking forward okay. to it. All right. So, Nin So Jik Benendo Dem, Mampim Chiging Don Jaba. I'm from the Chiging First Nation. My Anishinaabe name is Ojik, and that means the fisher in my language. So, bojo, nana bojo, Anishinaabe dok. If any of you are Anishinaabe speaking people out there, 
I greet you in the name of our culture hero, Nanabush, who is also our trickster, people would say. But that's how we greet each other in our language. We say bojo, nanabojo to each other. So I, I say that to each and every one of you. And then I would say as well, uh, and I agree to every one of you, my fellow um, fellow people living on earth here. This is a, a great opportunity for me. And I, I take the chance to actually uh, um, share what, what I'm working on, what ha I have been working on for, for many years. I used to work at the place called the Ojibwe Culture Foundation, and it was, uh, they had recorded numerous elders in our area, which is the North Shore of Lake Huron and Manitoulin Island. And the, the title for this talk is called Waking Up the Medicine. And that was taken from a, a, a teaching by the late Ojibwe elder, Dan Pine. And he said, uh, and that means in our language, maybe right now our medicine is sleeping. And he says, for a long time, our medicine has been sleeping for a long time. He says, maybe now, maybe today we should wake it up and, and thus rely upon it. So what I want to talk about here is a bit about uh, the sources of Anishinaabe history. And I want to take a bit of more expansive uh, look at it. Uh, primarily Anishinaabe hist history that's written about Anishinaabe people focuses or utilizes three main sources, documents written by priests, fur traders, and Indian agents. So they're usually all uh, non-native people and written in English. What my kind of life's work has been is to actually look at what the elders have, have to say. And uh, as I introduced myself in Ojibwe, I actually, as a child, I, I didn't speak Ojibwe. When I was a child, I heard my uh, parents speak in Ojibwe every day. But uh, when they turned to speak to my siblings and I, they ended up uh, speaking English, so I never picked it up. Only as an adult, when my first child, my eldest child was conceived, that's when I decided that I would try and learn. But I'm still not fully fluent yet. I don't really speak. I, I say a lot of simple things, but not the full things. The drum on your right is actually a drum that's in the British Museum, and it was collected on Manitoulin Island at the delivery annual delivery of presents. Uh, I'll explain a bit about what that is later. And this pipe uh, bowl here is actually one that was in the Sir Francis Bondhead's family and handed down. And it recently came up for auction. That's the one that's in the middle. But that pipe uh, apparently is could be tied to the Manitoulin Treaty of 1836, what we colloquially call the Bondhead Treaty. And then the medal on the left is a, is a silver medal delivered at the Treaty of Niagara in 1764 to a number of different nations, and it's used as a mnemonic device. So what I try to do is basically, we call our life way or our culture Anishinaabe Bemadzuin. That Anishinaabe Bemadzuin means Anishinaabe life. And where I'm looking at this, how to revitalize it are these interstices, interstice, uh, interstitial areas between material culture, oral traditions, and archival collections. And uh, as well, looking at what the elders have said. So one of the things that uh, a lot of people, you may have heard of uh, the Royal Proclamation that was issued in 7, October of 1763. And uh, this was actually issued after what is, has been called Pontiac's Rebellion, so-called rebellion or revolt. But actually it was in the process uh, prior to that, but that uh, the events and actions of the Odawa chief Pontiac, as well as the Seneca chief uh, Giasoto, uh, really ushered this along. And this basically what you'll hear lawyers talk about this document as the Magna Carta of Indian rights in Canada. And what I usually say to that is uh, actually that uh, the wampum belt that is pictured below it is actually our Magna Carta. We look at these, um, uh, we have a different tradition, an oral tradition, 
and we use mnemonic devices such as wampum belts here. This particular wampum belt is called the Covenant Chain Wampum Belt. And like I said, it was delivered in 1764 at Niagara, and it was entrusted to be kept by the Odawa people on behalf of the Western Confederacy, which included uh, 11 other nations, including Ojibwe, Potawatomi, Cree, Soto, uh, Sauk, and Fox, Menominee, and Ho-Chunk. That belt below that is often called the 24 Nations Belt, but I also like to call it the Eternal Promises of Presence Belt. So that on the left of that belt is the rock at Quebec, and some say it's all of North America, but then there are 24 nations, 12 of the Eastern Confederacy, 12 of the Western Confederacy, all bound by the strong cord of friendship. But this cord of friendship is actually tied to that ship. And uh, they promised us in 1764 that they would deliver presents or warmth, warmth to our country from England uh, and that that ship would never be empty. That ship was laden with cloth, blankets, gunpowder, fish hooks, net, thread, all kinds of goods. And that this was supposed to go on as long as the sun shone, the grass grew and the waters flowed. This is a reimagined uh, painting uh, of uh, Sir William Johnson's manor on the south shore of Lake Ontario. And around it is a council fire. And uh, also beside it are their the native people are in council with the redcoats who we call Miskokunye, the, the redcoats meaning the British. And you see that they uh, are actually in deliberations. And to us, is, there's more to go into here, but uh, to us, sitting around the council fire is a way, is our way of conducting business, as well as renewing alliances. So this particular treaty that we entered into with the British was actually affected around a fire, and tobacco, our, one of our sacred medicines, was actually uh, utilized and given to us by the, the British. So below that is actually a, a painting that was done in and around 1845 at Manitowning on Manitoulin Island, where I'm from. So you see there, there's, uh, in, you may see at the bottom, there's uh, two men standing and they're flanked by two chiefs. The one chief with the uh, uh, admiral's uniform is Jean-Baptiste de Siganoc. And then on the other hand, uh, the other side, we are uncertain who that chief is. But in the middle is the uh, Indian agent, uh, George Ironside and uh, also Samuel Peters Jarvis, who was the, uh, the uh, Superintendent General of Indian Affairs at that time. So you see that uh, at the council fire, uh, by the actual, beside that red building, are piles of red, uh, blue cloth, white cloth, black cloth. And then you can't see this, but uh, trust me, there are uh, guns leaning against that building, all kinds of guns. So that's what they would give us every year. And uh, on Manitoulin Island, from 1836 to 1854, they delivered presents here. And people, Native people from Nipissing, which is by North Bay, Ontario, as well as uh, Menominee people from uh, Green, Bay, Green Bay, Wisconsin, would come here in the month of August to receive their presents, but also to renew their alliance with the British. So the... Some of the readings that I've done, they talk about how mnemonic communities are actually discourse communities. And what that means is that the mnemonic devices only carry the meaning uh, once it is transmitted and understood by the mutual, mutually understood by each party. So during the 1840s, the British actually knew what we were talking about and they used the same metaphors that we did. Uh, similarly, they knew that in 1764, but now you get up to this day and age, and we're, we're living with the results of that uh, loss of communication uh, uh, or that unilateral communication, and that there is no longer the shared meaning uh, that bound ourselves with that treaty and that wampum belt. So here, these are. this is a list of the nations that were attended uh, that were recorded as attending the Treaty of Niagara in 1764. And you see that wampum belt, wampum belt below, uh, meaning all of the 24 nations, but there actually may have not been necessarily 24. And then also that this medal has the date 1764 on it. But this whole um, relationship 
is uh, depicted in that picture there. And the chiefs used this metal as a mnemonic device as well. And I'll show you, I'll explain this to you and show you. The other thing is uh, what, I, what I showed you in the previous slide on the metal is actually this calumet, step, calumet pipe stem and this eagle wing that acts as a clasp. Part of my research is looking at the museum collections and this one was a, a, a particularly beautiful calumet pipe stem held at the Peabody Museum in Boston, Massachusetts. And you see there, uh, the other thing that I'm researching is each of these different nations that came down to Niagara, they brought their pipe and they deposited it with Sir William Johnson, who was the uh, Superintendent General of Indian Affairs at the time. And he said that he would keep each of these pipes and the, the, the chiefs that uh, delivered them actually said, so that we, del we delivered this pipe here so that if any of our people come here, they will smoke out of it. Furthermore, they said, all the other nations around will look at this pipe and they will see that it belongs to our nation and they'll know that we are allies to the British. So what I'm currently researching is how these different pipe stems, what, I, I don't really know what are the distinguishing features between an Ojibwe calumet pipe versus a Sauk or Meskwaki calumet pipe. But that's the kind of research I'll be doing in the future. So where I got switched on to this is there was a document that a friend of mine named Darlene Johnson had given me and a fellow named Reverend Hallen who was stationed at Coldwater in the 1830s and 40s. Uh, he, he actually met Jean-Baptiste de Siganoc, who was an Odawa chief and keeper of this wampum belts. And he actually made a sketch and a rubbing of these belts and he counted the number of beads on each of the strands and the rows. Then uh, the other thing that I ended up finding, I went to the United Chief and Councils of Nidominissing, Manitoulin Island, their archives, and uh, I was going through some of their, their materials. And I, I started to find that Ojibwe language uh, was written and used by our chiefs. Ojibwe literacy, uh, our chiefs engaged in Ojibwe literacy. And this is one of the, the, the letters that actually that I use when I recite this belt. I had memorized this speech, this petition, and uh, it says Michigwednong, June 27, but Michigwednong is the old word for the reserve I currently live on, meaning Michigan. Anyway, it says, uh, this is, uh, it says, Yavanigit Kendan, Gashiganod Nadwaba, Nagitizi Mak, Api, Jirwakajio Nadwa, Awe Migazian. I still know how you spoke to my ancestors when you bid them to go to war. Anyway, this recites all of the promises that were made in 1764. So it actually shows the transmission of that uh, 1764 wampum belt and how the mnemonic community utilized that wampum belt. And uh, we say that the wampum belt actually encoded and recorded the, the words that were spoken over that belt. So these belts were actually passed down to various keepers and they were brought out at every uh, council at Manitowani at that time, as well as other council fires. But here you see, this is, uh, I mentioned that these medals were important and they were given to the chiefs as a symbol of land. This is, uh, this fellow's name is George Gebeose. And Gebeose means walking all the way through or to the full extent. And he was a, a chief at uh, Garden River First Nation by Sault Ste. Marie, but he was a descendant of uh, one of the chiefs that actually uh, attended the Niagara uh, Conference in 1764. He wrote a manuscript in, in and around 1910, 1911 uh, of his version of Ojibwe history. And it's currently housed at the Canadian Museum of History. Anyway, he says that uh, according to his ancestors and his grandparents and parents, that uh, they received these medals. And he said, my agreement will be as good when you arise in the bright spring morning, as you see the sun arising over the hills like a big fire to warm yourselves. Thus, my promise will be as good as the sun, and it will last as long as it will arise and set. And I will be as your father, and I will take care of you as a father takes care of his loved children. And remember that I have promised you an everlasting friendship. The envoy then took the medal and said, you see, this medal is round. It has no end. Then taking the chief by the hand, 
said, I take you forever to be my child. So here, this is the one of the important things is that this, uh, this circular, uh, the use of the circle as a symbol. So these are three medals that are actually held at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, Ontario. And uh, I, I went down there and researched them. But the other thing that I did was I looked up the Ojibwe names in different correspondence and, and uh, different dictionaries of what the word for uh, a medal would be. And there I found uh, at least four, Kikinwajjun, Napkwagan, Biapkons, and Chigan. So the first, the last, first and the last word are actually related. And that means I mark or blaze. And you know, when you go and you mark a, a trail, you cut a branch or you break a branch, that's called uh, blazing a trail or making a mark. And that's what that kin watch chike is. Napkwagan just means that a necklace is something worn around your neck. So it could be a necklace or a tie or a choker or anything like that. And then biopkons just means a little piece of metal. Anyway, uh, these are different ways that the, the chiefs had referred to these in different speeches. And it depended on who the audience was and how, that's how, what word they would use when they were addressing, uh, if they were derisively addressing the relationship, they would just call it biopkons, meaning just a metal. But if they were trying to coax the uh, Indian Affairs agent, uh, they called it uh, that it, we made a mutual mark to indicate our allyship. So that's what that uh, word would indicate. So here, again, this is a, a letter from the archives and it was uh, uh, written at Garden River and it was a general, what they call a general Indian council. And these were uh, the people that were assembled were chiefs from the North Shore of Lake Huron again, that I mentioned, as well as Manitoulin And they had written in this uh, petition, they said they were told by their great father, the king, that he would not always live to look after them and their rights, that after his decease, efforts might be made by evil disposed persons to deprive them of their presence. And if they were ever so unfortunate as to lose them, all they would have to do would be to present the treaty and the medal, which I give them to my successor in the throne of England, and both the covenant and the promise would be speedily and faithfully carried out and the presence restored to them. So I often, uh, we, we, a lot of people are talking about the metal, I mean, the wampum belt these days, but not many are talking so much about the metals. Uh, so I, I, my work, I've been trying to expand how we look at uh, our, our records of what a treaty is and what were the material uh, devices that were used when a treaty was affected. So we're trying to put those two together. And then those both are actual records of that treaty of 1764. So here, this is a picture of me at the uh, one uh, on your left is I'm at the National Museum of the American Indian. And then on the other, I'm at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. And these are wampum belts that were given to the uh, Western Confederacy. One of them is to the uh, Delaware, and then another is supposedly Tecumseh's uh, Great Wampum Belt, but I have a different theory on that. And I believe it's actually an Odawa belt that was uh, kept at the uh, Michelin Mackinac. And then the other are those calumet stems, and you see there that there are three different types of calumet pipe stems. So I, I don't know which nation is attributed to which, and that's subject to further research. So what I do is I actually ask the elders a lot about uh, uh, a lot of different things. And here is a particular program that I was involved with before I undertook my uh, uh, doctorate studies. And I worked at Lakeview School in Chiging, my home community, and we recorded elders, and then we recorded them talking about uh, different little stories, so medicines and plants they use, historical tales, encounters with the spirit, and customs and practices. But this uh, video, I hope it works, uh, is when we were at the National Museum of Natural History, and uh, we, we were talking about this particular vessel. <laughs> So what I do with those with these uh, interviews is I actually record the elders 
and then uh, I write out, I'm the one who wrote out what was said. I write it out in Ojibwe and then I get a, um, and then I get, uh, this is Dr. Marianne Corbier there on your right. Uh, I get her and other elders to actually check over my work. And then we put these on to the uh, uh, internet. And we are, that's our effort to increase the amount of Anishinaabemwin resources uh, that are spoken. There's a lot of, uh, right now, currently, there's a lot of words uh, that are translated. And uh, it's good that that's happening, but. Um, the way our language works, we actually need to get um, more discourse samples out there, more natural speech. And then also the other thing that's happening, I find, is that a lot of our concepts, um, a, a lot of English concepts are kind of being force fit into Ojibwe. So for example, uh, decolonization and, and even um, uh, reconciliation. So we, we've been asked, uh, myself, uh, to ask elders, what's the Ojibwe word for reconciliation? What's the Ojibwe word for decolonization? And my um, position, we, we've done that, but my position has been, let's first find out what our concepts are in Ojibwe before we actually start supplanting them with English concepts. Uh, however, um, I think I'm, uh, I'm kind of losing the, the fight because each uh, language does evolve with its, uh, with, uh, with its uh, culture and uh, its societal movements. But uh, my work, I, I feel like I'm trying to actually uh, look at the past, look at what the elders who are currently first language speakers, how they, how they talk, and then to come up with the concepts and draw the concepts out of there, but also researching what was done in the past. So that was my little presentation on uh, what, what I tried to do uh, in kind of in a nutshell. Thank you so much for that, Professor Cobier. Really wonderful to learn from you. Um, so now we have um, an opportunity for the audience to ask uh, Professor Cobier any questions you may have. As I said before, please go ahead and use that Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions and um, the team will send them my way. So I see we don't have any questions in queue right now and that's okay, everybody's taking their time typing. So I'll ask one of my own. Um, Professor Kobier, how can um, old Ojibwe terms help us understand our shared diplomatic history? One of the, like I mentioned in the, in, in the actual uh, uh, PowerPoint, during the PowerPoint, one of the words for metal, that I, the, for the metal, peace metal, was uh, chigun, And then kinwachchigun is actually kinwachchige, that's the verb to make a mark or to blaze a trail. And then when you add uh, uh, the suffix on there, you actually make it into a noun. And uh, that's a normal practice. But then the, the other word that is, is there is can watch one. It actually, it doesn't refer to it as kind of a, a standalone tool. The, the actual uh, object makes it sound like it's a, a, a one that is mutually understood. Um, so that's part of what the promise of these, uh, these words are. The other is for a long time, I didn't know what the word for wampum belt was. In, in Ojibwe. And then uh, I found uh, a dictionary uh, and then an older dictionary that had it, but I still didn't know the word because of the orthography, the way they write Ojibwe. So I had to try and find out how that actually makes sense. And the first, my first iteration of it was uh, migis. Migis in our language means wampum. Uh, and then it actually had a, a second part of the word and uh, uh, the Jesuit Martin Farrard was stationed on Manitoulin, and then he sought to actually make the, uh, the words written in Baraga, Bishop Baraga's dictionary more um, apparent and by, by adding accents on there to indicate vowel length. So anyway, when he wrote the word, it looked like the word was Miksavigan, 
and Miksabi Gan. The, the medial form of the word, that word is Abi, and that refers to strings. Something is stringed along. So it sounded like there that that word is actually wampum that is strung together. And then the, the, other, the other word I found, the other spelling, and this seems to be the one that's winning favor now, is mikis pikkan. And a pikkan now is the word for a uh, harness, a horse harness. But uh, historically, it actually was a, for a tump line. And you know, a tump line, when you carry it out of the bush, uh, something you, you tie it around your head or around your chest and you carry a, a heavy load. So what I often say about that uh, mikis pikkan is that it's uh, the load that is being carried. So it, it literally translates as the tump line of wampum. That's what that would uh, mean. But uh, in the, the cultural understanding then would be, since the tump line is used for a burden, and sometimes it's called a burden strap, that the burden is actually the message or the talk that is on the belt. So that's our, our cultural understanding of why it was called migis apikkan. Uh, the tump line of wampum or the burden strap of wampum and the burden that is being carried is the is the message or the talk that's on there. Very interesting. Thank you. I have a question from one of our audience members. Um, Sean asks, can you discuss some of the ways in which Anishinaabewan not language has changed over time and in what ways have has colonialism influenced the language? Uh, one of my favorites, I guess, is uh, um, the late great Basil Johnson, who is an Ojibwe author, prolific author, and worked at the Royal Ontario Museum for many years, and is an Anishinaabe, Ojibwe Anishinaabe, and Potawa, part Potawatomi from uh, Cape Croker Reserve, Neoshinigaming, but actually uh, was a band member of Wasoxing. Anyway, he had these tapes. When I first started to learn Ojibwe, he had all these uh, cassette tapes for a beginner course outline of Ojibwe. And at the back of that, uh, that he had all these lessons in there, but at the very end, he, he did a thing on morphology, but he didn't call it that. And the other thing he would do peppered throughout that, that uh, course outline were all these little cultural interpretations and insights. And one of the words that he, he talked about in there was the word ASEAN. And ASEAN nowadays, means a diaper. Uh, but uh, historically, ASEAN was the loincloth that uh, a man wore. So, so there's a, a cultural, the word, the words uh, function and purpose changed with the time. And uh, so I don't know what you want to say with that about that now. But uh, anyway, that that's an, uh, one of the clear cut examples of uh, where a language uh, changes to adapt to its time. And uh, men typically, unless they're at a, at a powwow, one of our dance uh, ceremonies, don't wear loincloths anymore. So now that word is used for a diaper. Interesting. Well, it's just like any other language that kind of evolves, right? And, yeah. and definitions change. So that makes sense. But yeah, that's so funny to go from loincloth to diaper. That's a, that's yeah. a fun one. <laughs> So I, I've got tons of questions rolling in, Professor Kobier. I'm going to try to get to as many of them as I can. Um, next one's from Danielle. I'm puzzled by the concept of the use of the word father in the context of treaties between um, peoples. Um, was this concept imposed or did it refer to another meaning of father, one that's more sort of maybe traditional? That's a, that's a good question. And uh, nowadays it's, it's very uh, paternalistic. It sounds very paternalistic because mm -hmm. they'll say that, and now we would say that the queen is our great mother and the king was our great father. And one of the late elders from this reserve, his name was Ernie de Vosque. And he used to say to us, uh, uh, if we're the red children and the queen is our great mother, then this is the biggest case of child neglect and abuse the world over. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but... <laughs> yeah, but anyway, yeah, that's, that's what he used to say. So, uh, but it was a different concept of father. Uh, and uh, to us, it, it wasn't imposed. We, when I mentioned that wampum belt there, throughout that uh, Treaty of Niagara, the, all the Western nations called 
the British at that time brother. And so when you look at kinship relations and in a society that is based on kinship responsibilities, especially clan ones, then uh, a father, uh, the father relationship takes on a different role. And the father relationship actually is more onerous than a child's relationship back to that father. So if we remain brothers, then brother to brother, you have obligations, but Sometimes you can't, uh, um, it, they're equal responsibilities to each other. So at the Treaty of Niagara afterward, Sir William Johnson actually said to the, a number of the nations that were there at the time, we will take care of the adoption ceremony later. And then he actually delegated or dep uh, deputated the, uh, uh, the Shawnee people to go and he actually sent a, a delegate there to, to undertake the adoption ceremony whereby the British became the father. And it was a, a ceremonial role. role. And the, the other part of it is, uh, if you look at it that way, we thought that the father then is to give, be more giving to his child. Yes. It, wasn't, it, wasn't an author, it wasn't an authoritative uh, position to us. A father didn't command his children but a father gave willingly and even over himself uh, at the expense of his own needs to his children. So that was, uh, we, and in some senses, the, some of the indigenous people and the chiefs thought they were getting the better end of the deal at that time, that they, they were taking on more, the British were taking on more responsibility by saying that they were gonna be the father. But if they remained the brother, they wouldn't have as much uh, responsibilities to clothe and feed us as, uh, as this uh, re relationship uh, uh, developed. The other thing is that the, the British, when they wore, wear that red coat, they often said that they imitated the sun to us. And then you, you have heard of the phrase, as long as the sun, sun shines, the grass grows and the rivers flow. And in that speech that I showed you that's written in Ojibwe, they actually make reference to that. And they say, as the, you, he says, the British had said to us at Niagara at that time, he said, when you're looking for the life of livelihood of your children, do not look to the south, west, or north. And they, they said, Wabanong Wenjimokseb Gizis, Kauab Ma Gizis, Jimaskwap Kagujing. Look to the east and you will see the sun rising red. And it is of the same color that I wear. And that's how you'll know these promises are still in effect. And he said, and as that sun gets higher, all the earth will be will receive its warmth indiscriminately. And that again is the image of a father. That the father is to provide that warmth indiscriminately to all his children. So he was supposed to be, in a sense, a, an arbiter, as well as a provider, as well as a, a, a settler of uh, disputes. So, and he was supposed to be impartial. Uh, and that was the, the other part. So anyway, when they use that imagery of the sun, they say, uh, when that sun gets higher, uh, that there will appear flowers all over the place. And then this was the refrain, refrain of that speech. And it says, uh, That is the image of the life of your children. So the image of the, the life, the image of the life of your children, if you take this wampum belt and you enter into a treaty with us, is a beautiful sunny day and uh, flowers all over your path. So, and that was what, the, and then that the sun to us, is the father and mother earth. So that's the, the other part of that. So a good that, question though. It's yeah, a, it's, it's, I, fascinating. And, and I did, I also wanted to thank Danielle again for that excellent question. Thank you. And thank you of course for your response. So I'm getting lots of questions about mnemonic devices. And um, like some of our audience, I had no idea about the use of metals. I knew a little bit about wampum belts. 
and people are really curious about how extensive the use of these devices um, was. Can they be used between individuals or is it between two peoples? Um, some folks are asking about, you know, are they still um, in use? Like, are, it, it, can these can these be, you know, pointed to as symbols of treaties? The way that we do that with with wampum belts and today. So that's what my uh, research has led me to believe that yes, that these mnemonic devices are still used by our people. And you actually look at the number of treaties out west, and they also had uh, medals that were delivered at that time as well. But the medals that we have for these pre-confederation uh, treaties, they have that specific uh, message, uh, I mean, scene on there. And on that scene, in that particular medal that I'm talking about that I showed, the, the medal is of a native person and a non-native person sitting under a tree, smoking a pipe beside a fire. And then there, and in an earlier version that was given by the Quakers, they're actually, the, the Quaker is sitting on one side of the fire and the native person, the Anishinaabe person sitting on the other side and he's handing the pipe over and then the sun is in the middle. So that whole device there is, uh, uh, that whole image is about that treaty uh, um, relationship and then taking it to the council fire. And what I didn't get to mention here is in that particular speech that I showed where that was written out, it actually, in there, they, they said that, that the British had said, uh, in the middle of your island, I stand up a tree. And around that tree that I have erected, I sweep all around it and clear, clear it out. And I take a mat and I roll that mat out. Here, these are highly uh, metaphoric um, uh, use of language here. Of course, the tree to us is the tree of life or the tree of peace. And then in uh, a number of different songs and uh, a number of different uh, stories that we have, to sit under, to sit smoking a pipe under a tree means profound peace. Similarly, smoking a pipe on a mat beside a fire also means profound peace. So there's a, there's a, a, a pictograph um, that's uh, drawn in uh, John Tanner's uh, uh, auto, uh, well, biography. And in there, he, he has a, a man sitting on a, on a mat. And then that's what he says. This is Nana Bojo sitting on his mat uh, until the end of the world beside a fire and he is he is experiencing profound peace so a lot of these metals the pictures therein actually talk a bit more about the the uh, uh, the relationship so standing up a tree also meant in different uh, different contexts and different uh, iterations of the of the speech in in councils was it meant a flagpole as well so that flagpole, they would put up, of course, the uh, Union Jack, but at other times they actually made special flags. And I didn't get to explain this, but in that painting that was done on Manitoulin, you saw that there was a red flag and it had the Union Jack in the corner, and then it had three yellow blotches on there. But that actually the, was this, uh, the yellow was a beaver, a lion, and the crown. And it represented that symbolism of the alliance between the British and the Anishinaabe again. So there are numerous ways that, uh, uh, and that was the other thing that uh, uh, reportedly by our uh, chiefs had said that Sir William Johnson had said that he had pointed to the sky and to the sun all that time while making these promises. And he says, Nishke ni John Siduk, Kachim nado nanon dak ejigano ninago. And he's pointing to the sun and he says, the sun and the creator, meaning the creator, here's how I am talking to you. Therefore, these words cannot be violated. So that was what his promise was. And <clears throat> so these uh, mnemonic devices, especially uh, metals, 
wampum belts and pipes, as well as that drum, all depict different stories and uh, the way we historically used uh, our communication between ourselves was, was that way. So we have wampum belts with the Haudenosaunee people, also with the Delaware, as well as with the Huron Wendat, as well as the Menominee, the Sauk Fox. So to answer the question uh, more succinctly, yes, there was a system that uh, between inter, what I would say international symbolism in the Great Lakes area that was manifested on wampum belts. And oftentimes they were, er, in earlier times, the, uh, they were just uh, lines and geometric shapes like squares, triangles, diamonds, octagons, and uh, hexagons. And then they, they had to actually keep and maintain that talk. And by, by that, I mean that they met frequently in order to actually renew what was on that document, what was said over that document, meaning the wampum belt. Otherwise, they, would, they, they could potentially lose what its meaning was. So this is the difference between what the Anishinaabe people believe for treaty, is that once a wampum was exchanged and a treaty affected, that it was to be maintained, that you entered into a relationship that was to be fostered. The, the opposing view is the, the one taken by the British and the successive settler governments is that once a treaty was signed, it was an over and done deal and that they could uh, walk away from the council fire and, and not bother with the Anishinaabe people. But that wampum belt, as I said, we look at it as the Magna Carta but we also see it as the, the commencement of our relationship together. And I didn't get to explain that it actually embodies our Aboriginal, what lawyers call our Aboriginal title, as well as our hunting Aboriginal right to hunt and fish, as well as um, uh, payment for past services, as well as uh, protection. They, in the Royal Proclamation, they offered us protection and in that uh, protection now, now we call that fiduciary responsibility. So there's a lot in that belt that actually is uh, uh, our record of our relationship uh, with the British crown and uh, the resultant success of government, successor government. So interesting, thank you. And I, I just wanna also mention, we're, we're out of time for questions, but I love that you referenced the wampum belt as a document. I think that that is, it's such an, I, I studied history as well. And, um, you know, when I think about documentation, it's written words, right? right? But I love the fact that you're really thinking about this in a, in a truly unique and culturally appropriate way. And I just wanted to remark on that because that really struck me. So I do have to wrap up. I wish I could carry on talking to you and carry on asking the great questions from the audience, but um, I do need to wrap up. Thank you so, so much for your Thank time you for today, your for sharing your work. It's absolutely fascinating. I know I learned an awful lot. Okay, miigwech. Thank you, I say. Thank you. Okay. All right. So before we say goodbye to you in the audience, thank you also for taking the time to join us today. And we have another poll question for you, which is how would you rate your knowledge of today's topic following this discussion? And that should pop up on your screen now. So as I wrap up, please take a moment to answer that. Um, excuse me. Um, you can should join us next week as well. Um, on September 22nd, next Wednesday, we will be talking about privacy in virtual classrooms. And then two weeks from today on the 29th of September, the key to equity and inclusion in online classrooms, lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. So as always, for more information about these and other events, you can visit our website, yourq.ca slash alumni and friends. And if you have questions, comments, advice for us, you can always reach out uh, on social media or contact us alumni at yourq.ca. Thank you so much for your time today and be well.